one more person coming in here. Hey. Well, we're going to start on chapter two, and this this chapter is um, an interesting one because it kind of overlaps with the first chapter. You'll have this happen a lot in the Old Testament where it will give you a chapter, and the next chapter might happen actually during... Josh, there's a lot of Josh. There's a lot of feedback. Okay, how about now? Better, a lot okay. better. But the first chapter um, has a lot of overview, and it kind of overlaps with the second chapter. And so, what's happening in the second chapter is, if you do the the years, it's kind of what was happening at the end of the first chapter. Remember, at the end of the first chapter, Daniel and the other youths get promoted as King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar examines them. Well, this is to be seen kind of in the same uh, time frame at some point where King Nebuchadnezzar is examining them, this whole fiasco with his wise men happens. And it explains why three... Um, or four young Jewish boys might be promoted much higher than all the other people in the kingdom was it was happening at the same time as this struggle. So let me give you a little bit of background about uh, ancient empires in general, and especially the Neo-Babylonian empire. Ancient empires um, were not what we think about when we think about the Roman empire where there was an administration and the administration really survives the emperors. Even the Roman Empire wasn't like that. There were so many civil wars and there was so much strife and infighting. There were times when the empire just completely fell apart and had to get uh, put back together by a powerful figure. Even if you study Chinese history, there will be decades or even hundreds of years of dysfunction and breakup between uh, efficient, continuous governments. The Neo-Babylonian Empire only lasted about 70, 80 years tops. When King Nebuchadnezzar got the throne, he got it from his father. And his father um, left it to him, and he kind of had to cobble together an administration. And so when he did, it was kind of a precarious situation because the people who populated the empire um, were people from his uh, ethnic group, from his tribe, from his, um, I'd say from his extended family. And so the ethnic group uh, there are called the Chaldeans. And remember, um, if you were in my Abraham study, we talked about Abraham having uh, probably a very powerful family up in the Babylonian nobility of the old Babylonian empire and how they left because there were a lot of struggles, a lot of, uh, you know, people fighting for power. So the Chaldeans, um, if you read that piece of paper in front of you, good. If not, we'll quickly um, go over it. And what they're doing is they're talking about two theories of who the Chaldeans were because there's this word, and it's the Kazdim. Kazdim. That's the Aramaic um, word. It's used in Herodotus and his histories. And it talks about how when Nebuchadnezzar took power, uh, the Kazdim were put in all the top positions of the empire. He had to quickly staff his empire with basically his cousins, extended family, his clan, his tribe all the educated and rich people from that, from that big group so that he could maintain power before he would be either assassinated or a civil war would break out. And these Chaldeans were um, the upper echelon of the Neo-Babylonian society. Kind of like if right now, if we held the election and the Democrats uh, won the presidency, Joe Biden and his people would staff all of the uh, government staff and the administration with DNC appointees. That's kind of what's happening here. 
and it was a very precarious situation for an emperor to be in because if somebody was kind of laying back and waiting to uh, take over, this would be the time when a new administration is, is filling all these positions in the capital with government appointees. So in the back of King Nebuchadnezzar's mind, he knows that he is very um, threatened at this point. The other side of the coin is a lot of these people he's staffing are religious leaders. And it refers to the Chaldeans, uh, but it means like a religious leader or an astrologer of the Chaldeans. Um, they're, they're magicians, they're soothsayers, the people who watch the heavens and build star charts telling you when to do something and when not to do something because mm. the stars would tell you when the gods would be happy and when they wouldn't be happy. It's a very similar thing even in China today. If you're uh, not a Christian, if you believe the traditional Taoist practices, you consult a fortune teller before you get married or open a business or do anything big so they can tell you a bad day or a good day whenever you're going to plan to do that. So that's the type of people we're talking about in chapter two, when it says in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams. His spirit was troubled and his sleep left him. Then the king commanded that the magicians, the enchanters, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans be summoned to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. So you can see that this group of people he's got are the top people in his new government. Part of them are his cousins and people who are part of his tribe and his clan, and part are probably religious leaders who have been in Neo-Babylonian high society for some time. And he doesn't know who he can trust. And obviously, his dream was terrifying to him, and he thought that the gods communicated through his dreams. So he has a dream, and imagine being him where you don't know who's loyal and who's not. Mm. So he tells him, I had a dream, and my spirit is troubled to know the dream. Then the Chaldeans said to the king in Aramaic, O king, live forever. Tell your servants a dream, and we'll show you or show the interpretation. The king answered and said to the Chaldeans, The word from me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you shall be torn limb from limb, and your house shall be laid in ruin. But if you show the dream and its interpretation, you shall receive from me gifts and rewards and great honor. The commentaries I've read, um, they say, why was it that Nebuchadnezzar would be so critical and ruthless towards his administrators at this point in his young reign? Do you have any ideas of maybe why he was so upset with them? He's out of control. He's out of control? I mean, I would think that he would be afraid of losing control if these people can't tell him what's going on. Yeah, that's, uh, that's one thing. He's scared that he may lose his empire really, really early in his days. Yeah. Anybody else have an idea? Well, when you're the king, you're the target of everybody, especially those with ambitions to be the next ruler. Mm -hmm. so even, even family members could be part of a conspiracy like that. So you that like is, you said, you can't trust anybody. That's kind of what one of the commentaries said, is they said he believed the dream, and you imagine his dream, this big four-layered statue, getting hit with a rock and toppled. Of course, he thinks it's him, and he wants to know who is trying to kill me, who's trying to assassinate me. So as this commentary said, he might be doing the old divide and conquer trick where he takes all of his, his minions basically and says, y'all tell me what the dream means. If not, I'm going to kill you all. <laughs> and they sit back and they start going, you know, is it them? Is it them? And so he's making them kind of tell on the rat. Who is the rat? Who's trying to get That's me? And so it's a little bit of shrewd statecraft for him to threaten them all with death if they don't help him. 
on the other side of the coin, there might be some healthy skepticism. He's saying, y'all have not told me one thing to help me, all of you, who supposedly can talk with the gods and tell the future. Unless you tell me my dream, I know you're worthless, and I'll just get rid of you. So he might have just hit his last straw with this phony religion that can't really tell him what's going on. Um, it, has anybody else got a different translation than the ESV, like a King James in verse 5, that they can read it to us? I don't. I got a new King James. Uh, let's see what new King James says in verse 5. Yes. Chapter 2. Verse 5. Here at the same time, I can't multitask. <laughs> okay, verse 5. Uh, the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, My decision is firm. If you do not make known the dream to me and its interpretation, you shall be cut into pieces. All right. And your houses shall be made an ash heap. Keep going. Six. No, that's good right there. Um, that one has a little bit different way of the... Uh, a little bit different punishment, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, does anybody have another translation that that's substantially different? Mm -mm. Okay. What about um, verse? I'm looking. I'm looking down a little bit. It's one of these verses here. Uh, verse. Eight, the end of verse eight, because you see that the word from me is sperm, is what the ESV says. Do y'all have a different translation, anybody? Mine says, um, but if you don't tell me the dreams, you certainly can't expect me to believe your interpretation. Right. Hey, Josh, verse eight? Yes. Okay, okay, got it. Yeah, Christian Standard Bible said, the, the king replied, I know for certain you're trying to gain some time because you see my word is final. Yeah. So you can see that he really is serious. I'm going to make your house an ash heap or tear you limb from limb or uh, whatever punishment. And he just does not trust them. He thinks that they are they're playing with him. Mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to draw him out. Uh, maybe they're looking at a chance to finally get rid of him. And they think this is still early in his reign. Um, let's keep him, you know, basically boxed in where he doesn't know what's going on. And, and he kind of calls their bluff. So, you know, I, what do y'all think? Um, you're sitting here, you're one of these soothsayers or enchanters or a Chaldean and your king's going crazy and the whole time you've been basically making it up as you go along just to keep him happy. <laughs> now he's like, all right, you tell me what I dreamed or you're, you're bad things. <laughs> what would you do? This might be a good time to find a new job, right? <laughs> yes. Well, um, if you look at your, your uh, fill-in-the-blank sheet, you can see that number one, the dream of Nebuchadnezzar made him very blank of his advisors. Very? Wary. Or suspicious, Wary. suspicious or distrustful, any of those work. Number two, being a new king, because we talked about how precarious this time was in a new administration's reign, Nebuchadnezzar didn't trust the administration around him to be blank about the interpretation of his dream. Truthful. Truthful or honest, yes. That's going on now. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Some things never change. That's true. <laughs> so in verse 10, the Chaldeans answered the king and said, 
There's not a man on earth who can meet the king's demand. For no great and powerful king has asked such a thing of any magician or enchanter or Chaldean. The thing that the king asks is difficult, and no one can show it to the king except the gods, whose dwelling is not with flesh. So they basically, uh, they, they put return to sender and say, you know, you're asking something that we can't do. Even though they claim to be able to tell what the gods think, they're basically passing the buck to the gods. Verse 12, because of this, the king was angry and very furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed and they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. So the executioners are coming. And Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, why is the decree of the king so urgent? And Arioch made the matter known to Daniel. And Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. So as you can see, this is uh, at a point where Daniel and his friends were not those called in in front of the king. That's why I said this is probably happening either during Daniel's preparation time or right before his examination or either right after so that chapter one is kind of pushing all these events together. But it hasn't happened probably to the point where Daniel and the king know each other face to face because he doesn't even know what's going on. So he might be, remember, they were going to be prepared for three years. They might have been, um, you know, basically just right in the beginning of their training or in the middle of it. And, um, and they're basically, you know, they're here and they're going, what, what's going on? Why are we about to be killed? So it says it's in the second year of his reign, but if you've ever read any history, they will talk about the first year of somebody's reign being the first full calendar year they're in office or in power. And so that partial year is like a zero year. So this is, uh, this is really probably in Nebuchadnezzar's third year because there's a partial year. That's the year of ascension. It's not counted. And so Daniel and his friends, um, they're probably still in their training or just about to complete it. And, and he's almost about to be killed for something he's not even in charge of yet. But he makes a request, and the king gives him a little bit of time. It's a pretty bold request, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> because, you know, you're about, to be, uh, you're about to be executed, but the king could probably make it a lot worse if you waste his time and make him even more mad at you. Well, he had nothing to lose. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Still, yeah, I think <clears throat> Daniel's pretty bold here. <clears throat> Sorry. In verse 16, it says he went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order to declare the interpretation. So he was supremely confident that God was not only going to tell him the dream, but that he was also going to tell him the interpretation. Right. And it wasn't a light thing to request to see the king. Because if he was in a bad mood, he could say, off with your head. No, I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> That's right. That's very true. So whenever we get to this point, um, Daniel begins to do his work, uh, you know, and this is going to be his pattern throughout the rest of the book uh, with some slight variations. But in verse 17, then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, his companions. And he told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision of the night. Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of the God forever and ever, to whom belong wisdom and might. He changes times and seasons. He removes kings and sets up kings. 
He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. And re he reveals deep and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and might and have now made known to me what we asked of you. For you have made known to us the king's matter. If Nebuchadnezzar had not gotten this answer at this point in time, he might have started a purge of his kingdom, cause it to collapse into calamity and civil war. His own clan might have fought and purged him, and a new king might have been set up. So when Daniel talks about God changing times and seasons, uh, we have to also look and see how his hand acted here, because in one fell swoop, God sidetracked and sidelined all of the counselors of King Nebuchadnezzar, all the foolish enchanters and diviners and Chaldeans and propped up these four youth from Judah and Nebuchadnezzar leaned on their wisdom for the rest of his administration and he was a long-serving king and we have to look back at that and see where some of their advice probably served him very well and kept him from falling into some foolish traps that his forefathers had fallen into. Um, what, do you, what else do you think from, from Daniel's hymn there? Because that's kind of a song or a poem, the way it's phrased. Uh, what else do you think about that that we can learn? Daniel was a man of strong faith. He, he knew that he, given the time, that God would reveal the, the, dream, the dream to him. You know what else is interesting? he gets it in a vision of the night is what it's called is what the what the bible says and this vision of the night or whether it was a dream or just a vision when he was up praying late um it's so vivid there's there's a, a theory that you know king nebuchadnezzar had forgotten his dream one of the older interpretations, I was trying to see if any of your Bibles said it. There was some older interpretations where King Nebuchadnezzar, instead of saying it's firm, says this thing is gone from me. It's departed mm. from me. And people say, uh, well, maybe he was talking about he forgot his dream. Because sometimes we forget our dream. We say it was really good. Mm. I forgot it. <laughs> that's, so that's an option, but that's also... Um, People who study Aramaic say that the translation, it is firm, referring to his decision to kill his counselors, is probably a more accurate translation rather than um, it is gone from me. And it's all, I don't know if you remember me writing some Hebrew on the board back in the Genesis study. Uh, we could do the same thing with Aramaic. Every word is a three consonant root. Um, and the word in question is azar, which is like a, a, a kind of like an A, but it has a guttural sound to it, a Z and an R. And, uh, you know, azar is one of those words where when you study it, look at it a certain way, it could be one verb or another. And as we've learned more about Aramaic, they think it means it's firm. So he knew the dream. He was testing his people. He hadn't forgotten it. And so... Daniel doesn't just come in with a, with a good story. He actually knows the dream because the king's expecting it. You don't tell me. Mm -hmm. I'm done with all of you. all So let's see what happens, and then we'll talk, about, um, we'll talk about what the vision means. So Daniel goes in, and let's pick up in chapter 2, verse um, 27. Because Daniel answers in a very good way. And people who, who say Daniel was wise, they point to this. Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show the king the mystery that the king has asked. So he basically says, Your government's worthless for what you want. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Your dream and the visions of your head as you lay in bed are these. To you, O king, as you lay in bed came thoughts of what would be after this. And he who reveals mysteries made known to you what is to be. 
But as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because of any wisdom that I have more than all the living, but in order that the interpretation may be made known to the king and that you may know the thoughts of your mind. So he's showing him, this isn't my wisdom, king. The reason God gave me this is so that you could know it. So in one quick paragraph, Daniel has basically said, your administration is worthless to tell you what's going to happen. Only the God in heaven, who I serve, can tell you these things. And the only reason he's told me is not because I'm wiser than them, but so that you would know it. So Daniel is setting himself up as a trusted advisor, a, basically a counselor, and a servant of the king. He's not putting himself over the king. He's not putting himself even beside the king. He's actually just telling the king, it's only God who can do this. And you're very, you're very lucky that he has sent me with this answer. And so he tells him the vision. And I'm going to condense the vision very quickly, but it's an image, a statue, a tall statue mm -hmm. with a head of gold, chest of silver, its torso and thighs of bronze, and its legs were of iron but its feet were of mixed iron and clay. And as I told you, Nebuchadnezzar probably thought it was him. He was the image. But he basically tells him, it's not you. It's what will come to pass after this. And so a stone, this is in verse 34, mm -hmm. cut out by no human hand, struck the image on its feet and broke them, broke them in pieces. Then all of it crashed down, became chafe, and the wind carried it away. But the stone that struck the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So as he tells him this vision and explains it to him, King Nebuchadnezzar is hes just in awe of it. Verse 46 says, he fell upon his face and paid homage to Daniel, commanded an offering of an incense be offered up to him. And he says, truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries, for you've been able to reveal this mystery. The king gave Daniel high honors and many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men of Babylon. So you see, that's why whenever at the end of chapter one, it says they stood before the king and in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired him, he found them 10 times better than the magicians and enchanters. It's probably condensing down what happened at their examination and like the first year of their service. And then in chapter two, we see the details of why he exalted them so highly. He, he really likes them because they were found and in a very difficult situation, they were honest and wise, and God gave them wisdom. So let's open this up to some questions. Um, up to this point, do you have any questions or comments or anything before we talk about the meaning of the vision? What do you think is going on in this chapter? Well, Gosh, I've always wondered. Was Daniel a late teen or early 20s when this happened? Or maybe older, I don't know. I've, I've never could figure that one out. The consensus among the uh, scholars is that he was um, about 13 or 14 when he was captured and trained, and that by now he's 15 to 17. Oh, my God. So a king's a man. Yeah, he's just barely, barely able to walk. <laughs> yep. And there's... Um, there's some more discussion. I don't know if y'all have ever dealt with it uh, in any commentaries or Bible studies you've read, but some people think that Daniel and his three friends were eunuchs. Um, because in chapter one, the chief eunuch is watching over them. There uh, are some theories that Daniel and his three friends were castrated to serve the emperor and that they spent the rest of their lives as eunuchs. But, what we can tell from Babylonian, um, you know, from their traditions and customs, the wise men that served the king were probably not eunuchs. There were eunuchs that served the king, but not all advisors or wise men were. And unless they made an exception for 
um, foreigners, and unless they just castrated them, Daniel and his three friends probably weren't castrated. Um, sometimes you see people who suspect they were, and they mean well, but I think they're probably taking too much liberty with the uh, with the text and applying one word to the chief eunuch and saying, well, look, the chief eunuch was over them, therefore all those boys were castrated, but that's not said in the text and that's not known from historical data. It just makes sense that the man in charge of training the administration would be one of the most trusted, uh, you know, eunuchs of the king's court um, so that they wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be trying to amass power for their own family. Well, let's talk about the vision. Um, most of y'all probably know this. Does anybody know the interpretation, the historical interpretation of that vision, of that image? I don't. The interpretation is leading to something that the Lord Jesus Christ will refer to in Luke chapter 21 when the Lord refers to the times of the Gentiles. This image and other things as we continue on in the book of Daniel is the basis <clears> of <throat> and the time of the Gentiles will describe these nations as Christ <clears throat> as the time when the Gentile nations exert authority and domination over Jerusalem and Israel until from that point about 605 BC until the second coming of Christ. And it's no coincidence that Daniel would be taken out in the first wave of the exile in 605, just like God used Joseph to take care of the nation of Israel as it grew in size in Egypt. God's in control of everything here we see in Daniel from bringing it back to him, execute his judgment in the seven years of exile, and to bring Daniel the power, just like you explained, Josh. And yes, as we that, keep on, we're going to see that he's in control. God is in control of everything that happens during this 70 years. That's correct. Now, I'm about to share um, an image here on my phone trying to get everything it's going to take me just a minute to get it pulled up have you ever heard that uh, the golden head was supposedly the babylonian empire yeah that's and what i'm about to show you this is uh what's what's coming up as an interpretation that somebody uh gave for who the different sections are here we go can y'all see that yep yep Yep. Yeah. All right. So according to this one, and there are some arguments over the thighs and the legs, by the way, the head of gold would be the Babylonian empire. And Daniel says as much where he says, you owe king, in verse 37, you owe king, the king of kings, whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom. He says, um, you are the head of gold. <coughs> Another kingdom inferior to you shall arise after you and yet a third kingdom of bronze and then a fourth kingdom. And so um, they say that the chest of silver is the Persian empire that takes over um, at the end of Daniel's life. You know, Daniel serves him for a little bit. Then the thighs of brass would be the Greek empire of Alexander the great. And the, remaining empires of his successors that split off of that then the iron legs would be rome whereas it the feet of iron and clay some people say it's the holy roman empire some people say it's uh, all modern nations up to this point some people say it's the latter roman empire um especially after the imperial phase when it splits into east and west um, some people say it's a future uh, confederacy in Europe 
that tries to revive the Roman Empire. A lot of it depends on uh, your view of the book of Revelation and your view of Jesus' teachings of the end time. But most people agree on the first two, uh, and most people agree on the, the third one. Some people will say that the thighs of brass are the Persian and that the breast of silver is the Meda, the Median, the Median Empire, but uh, the Medes and Persians are seen as one unit in the book of Daniel. So um, I think this is a good one. Um, I think if you read the rest of Daniel, you'll really see how it follows this type of progression of history. But um, he basically tells Nebuchadnezzar, um, this is what will happen after you. And as uh, Nebuchadnezzar hears it and sees his dream told to him and sees somebody who can truly read his thoughts uh, and, and knows what God is thinking, he sees an advisor that he can trust and he promotes him uh, highest in the land. And Daniel remains in his court from this point on as the last verse of chapter two tells us. Any comments or anything you can think of? Well, I have a question about the rock because in mine it says, but the rock that knocked the statue down became a great mountain that covered the whole earth. Can you share some light on the rock? I mean, yes. Uh, and this is going to get into, um, you know, and if y'all want to do a study of revelation and end times, uh, after this, Oh boy. Um, <laughs> I actually have done a, a six night study to church for in the book of revelation. I just, and I didn't give an opinion of my interpretation. I gave like the major four views of it. And then we talked about the three views of the millennium and it was, I mean, like 18 hours of teaching. No, it wasn't eight. It was about 12 hours of teaching and we didn't even get to half of it. But, um, the idea that a stone or a rock, um, would fall and become a mountain. It, it's a pretty, uh, it's a pretty interesting figure of speech. Um, when Jesus, uh, you know, comes to the earth and begins to preach the gospel of the kingdom, it, it's a rock, you know, it's a, it's a small rock. And eventually it grows, you know, like a lot of the parables talk about the leaven spreading through the whole lump. Um, it's a mustard seed and becomes a tree big enough for birds of the air to perch in. Um, this idea of a, of a rock knocking over statues and becoming a giant mountain, I think similar images are in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. And similar images are in the book of Revelation. And so I think that this rock is the teachings of the kingdom of God. And if you look, it hits the empire that's iron and clay mixed. And it topples the whole thing. And I think what you see in this is that what Daniel is seeing is that throughout human history, you're going to have a lot of empires, one after the other. And eventually one's going to come and it's going to knock the feet out of this world system and put a new kingdom that will never fall. If you look at history, the Roman Empire got knocked out by what? By Christianity. It took it over. And from that point on, um, there's been setbacks, but the gospel has marched across the entire world to the point where our uh, symbols of medicine have crosses on them. Our uh, idea of democracy it, across the world uh, comes from a view in which God gives rights to people that are inalienable and you know almost every nation on the planet has heard the gospel some have it some still need to hear it but if you look at what the kingdom of god has accomplished on earth and you look at this prophecy in daniel and you say can i see that in history yes okay. and there have been setbacks and there are times when the roman catholic church and the holy roman empire had a corrupt gospel that had to be reformed. But generally, history has been, since Jesus showed up on the planet, he's been walking from one end to the other, um, knocking people out and setting up governments that, that are more open to the spread of the gospel. And 
you know, you've got like, we'll talk about China right now because that's uh, one place I know more about. When you've got China that has more Christians than any other planet or any other uh, nation on the planet, up to 100 million Christians, even though it's a communist nation, who rules China? Well, you wait until uh, this dust up is over with the communist club down in the church. You'll see who rules China. It's not the communist party. It's Jesus. And we had a great thing going in our country. We seem to have backtracked for the past couple of decades. Um, I do pray there's a big revival, but, you know, we had this nation set up, basically, where the church was the most powerful social institution for over a century and a half. Not the government, but the church. I think Jesus has shown that he's knocked the feet out of the world system. And one day, he will, according to the book of Revelation, rule directly on this planet. And that mountain will be right there. And it talks about it in the other prophets where all the peoples of the earth will go to the mountain of God and learn from him. And the whole earth will be filled with the knowledge of God. I think that's what Daniel's looking forward to with that rock becoming a mountain imagery. Okay. Makes sense. Any other questions? Good questions, everybody who's been talking and asking. Well, in my commentary, because I was going to start on Revelations, and my commentary is, through, is J. Vernon McGee, and his thing was, don't start Revelations until you understand the Old Testament. Yes. So that's what I've been trying to do, is to go back and read in the Old Testament before I get back into the New Testament. And so, don't, don't start Revelation uh, trying to really understand it. Um, it's not just the Old Testament, but it's, it's the, there are a couple of big ideas in the Old Testament that Revelation perfects and completes. And one is the day of the Lord. Right. And the day of the Lord is one of those words where it can be used 20 different ways in the Old Testament, but it's always pointing towards the same theme. And then Jesus uses the day of the Lord in his ministry in a different manner. And then the book of Revelation is showing it from another angle. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think what Daniel is looking forward to here is what we would call the day of the Lord eventually. Yeah. Verse 44. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. And we can see that. The gates of hell will never prevail against the church. And God, the closing words of Jesus were, I will never leave nor forsake you. I, lo, I'm with you up to the ends of the earth. You know, I, he's here with us. This kingdom will never be taken away. So I think it looks forward to what starts in the ministry of Jesus, what continues to the church age. And eventually at the return of Christ is completely and fully actualized on the earth. But it talks about those thousands of years like it's one event. And uh, earlier before we started recording, mm -hmm. before everyone was here, we talked about prophetic compression. That oftentimes when God shows the future, it looks like, you know, a couple of words in a verse. But when we see it go across history, it's hundreds and thousands of years of event after event after event that gets drawn out but when the prophecy comes it comes out as one event one word because to god it's done it is going to happen you know take it to the bank it's 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 good for what it's written for josh one thing that um comforts me a little backing up a little bit in chapter two when daniel is speaking to the king and he says, it's he who changes the times and the epics. And this is the part that I really like because here we are in the midst of all this division in our country and with a very important election coming up. It is God. He removes kings and establishes kings. Yep. We just think we're voting, but it's God who decides who the winner is going to be. That's correct. And that's true. Whether it's someone that I like or don't like, God is still in charge. He has a reason for who he puts up or puts down. Um, so 
when I start to get all anxious in my stomach and knots about what's going on in our country, I just try to remember that. Yeah, God allows things to happen. Yes. In fact, he engineers things to happen. Right. That's true. In order to carry out his will. Yep. And our, our ultimate identity and our ultimate kingdom and our ultimate loyalty is, uh, is not to whatever nation we find ourselves. Though we do owe it our good and we owe it our loyalty, but ultimately our uh, loyalty to that rock that rolled off the cliff and smashed the feet of the statue. Like that, mm -hmm. that's going to be the one that we give our all to. Um, right. We are citizens of another kingdom, the everlasting yep. kingdom. And it's going to break all the other kingdoms into pieces, according to verse uh, 44. Amen. Um, well, any other questions or comments on chapter 2? No. I thought before you talked about the rock, I kept thinking that it was Mount Zion, that it was one of the mountains in Israel or over in the Middle East. I didn't think about the fact that is the sermons and lessons from Christ. I, I think that it's, uh, I mean, there's obviously imagery from all that, and I'm trying to find the spot in the book of Revelation. Um, I'm trying to do this on the fly is kind of tough because um, there's so much imagery in Revelation. Trying to remember where is that image? but you know it talks about new jerusalem coming down and landing on earth and looks like a gigantic cube and if and if you do the the math it's giant i mean it goes miles up in the air and everything and uh, it may be images of that city coming down and standing like a giant mountainous city in the middle of the world there's also image in the uh, prophets of the mountain of god um, in the future and it seems to go towards a time when the temple is different than it was for Israel then where God, you know, dwelt in it and all the nations came to it. And so uh, I think it's looking forward to those images in the book of revelation, the images in the old Testament prophets. Um, but just the idea that it starts off small and insignificant and then grows to become the most significant thing on, on planet earth is that's the same type of teaching about the kingdom that Jesus gave. And so I think it's just a similar motif, a similar image. I but, think in, I've been, I've been trying to read Psalms and I think in one of the books of Psalms, they talked about Christ going up the mountain and back down that I guess going to heaven, you know, going up and coming back down to earth but i can't remember which psalm it is i mean um but it 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 was one of the masonic psalms about and that prophesized christ and but i don't know remember which one josh what well, probably one of the psalms of ascent there are a big block of psalms towards the end that talk about that um, well, very good questions and discussion, and uh, next week we will start chapter three with the golden image and the fiery furnace, and we'll probably we'll finish chapter three. Um, Y'all have all heard that story since you've been kids, but it's still got some really good stuff in it, and uh, I won't do a flannel graph, though. Did y'all ever have the flannel graph when y'all were growing up? I did. Yeah, we, we had those, but... Uh, enjoyed it i hope y'all were edified and um i hope that uh, y'all have a great week um and that everything goes well for y'all stay safe all right you too take care thank you y'all right. take care